Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the International Women's Day panel, where we choose to challenge the need to constantly do and highlight the importance of taking more time out for you. My name is Louise Corbett. I am the head of story at The Bee Project and will be your moderator for today. This event is organised by Pure Group, Asia's leading, leading premium lifestyle brand located across Hong Kong, Shanghai, Beijing, Singapore and New York, and The Bee Project, a global mindfulness movement complemented by a seat for your headspace, a seat that we are all sitting on today. Bee Project exists to balance the intensity of modern life with a moment for ourselves, a moment to inspire and create mindful moments every day. Today, we are live streaming out to a virtual audience and I am joined here in this beautiful studio in Causeway Bay, Hong Kong, by a panel of experts from major global brands, including Dr. Dawn Su from Cigna, Samantha Chan from Pure Group, and Sue Lees from the Mandarin Oriental to share their knowledge and insights based on their experience, expertise, and research. I've been monitoring panels for some time now, but this would have to be the first that I have done wearing a mask and no shoes. <laughs> that being said, we're very happy to be here doing this to keep everybody safe and the beautiful yoga room wooden floors at Pure Causeway Bay in their pristine condition. Before we start, I also welcome all viewers to interact with us today by posting any questions you have to our panelists in the Zoom chat. Christiani, Head of Customer Experience at Pure, is here to help us to make sure you are heard and we'll put the questions forward from the chat. We value your input and we encourage you to engage. So let's start off by welcoming our panelists today. Welcome Dr. Dawn Su. Regional Medical Officer, Asia Pacific, Cigna. Dawn is a physician who envisions a world where health and technology intersect to deliver better care to every individual. Dawn currently leads Cigna's Asia Pacific clinical team in the delivery of health and wellness services to corporate and individual customers in Asia Pacific. Throughout her career, Dawn has led the formulation of evidence-based workplace wellness solutions and worked with multinationals on population health strategies aimed at improving employee engagement and reducing medical costs. Welcome Dawn. Thank you, happy to be here. <laughs> Welcome Samantha Chan. Samantha is a pure yoga instructor. Samantha has been teaching yoga for over 15 years. Samantha's vision and knowledge have grown to include not only yoga, but also women's health, life balance and total wellness. In addition to being a yoga teacher, and trainer, Samantha is a mindfulness teacher, a nutrition health coach, a Reiki master, a raw food chef and health educator, and a trained massage therapist. Welcome, Samantha. Nice to see you. <laughs> nice to meet you, everyone. And lastly, welcome Sue Lees, Director of Spa and Wellness at the Mandarin Oriental. Sue has over 20 years experience in the spa industry as Director of Spa and Wellness at Mandarin Oriental Hong Kong, which is the company's flagship property worldwide. Sue leads a team of over 60 specialists, and she's previously lived and worked in Spain, the Bahamas, Bermuda, Bahrain, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Qatar, the Maldives, Thailand, and the Cayman Islands. Welcome, Sue. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so let's kick off the panel today by getting a better understanding of the current environment in which we exist. Dawn, you've been working with organisations on delivering health and wellness services across the region for some years now. And a Cigna 2019 global wellness study showed that Hong Kong has the fourth lowest health and wellbeing score of all 23 markets surveyed across the world. To start, can we get or can you set the stress scene for us from what you've seen in the data? Yeah, so we've been running these wellness surveys annually for multiple years now. And I think what we've seen is that Hong Kongers in general, and most of us live here, so we would know, experience higher levels of stress compared not just to our global part um, neighbors, but also to our own Asian neighbors, Singapore, Thailand, and even China. Um, I think across the region, there is a general um, underreporting of this statistic because there is still a huge stigma attached to mental health disorders. Um, and I think that has only worsened with the pandemic. Um, 
within Hong Kong, I think if you look at uh, the genders, women tend to report lower levels of physical and mental well-being compared to their male counterparts. This is something we've seen not just in our own studies, but also in global studies um, done worldwide. About 15% of these women will say that their stress levels are unmanageable. Um, we would say that is burnout, essentially. Um, and a lot of these women, aren't, they're not just junior uh, working level uh, women. You'll see that even as we climb the corporate ladder, senior female execs, more than half of them will say they still fear judgment over um, prioritizing their family over work, for example. I think what is interesting, though, is when you look at studies done outside of Asia, uh, globally in the UK, for example, when they looked at men and women who are single and unencumbered, so they don't have caring responsibilities for the family, both genders actually report equal levels of stress. Um, so, so, you know, we can perhaps get to the conclusion that a lot of the additional stresses faced by women um, is likely due to the additional caring responsibilities they have at home on top of what they have to juggle at work. Um, and that's something perhaps fewer men experience. Um, don't want to make a sweeping statement. Mm. <laughs> but fewer men certainly are in that position compared to women. Um, and, and, and so the additional sort of unpaid work that we do, a lot of us do, is also probably the reason why we find less time to care for ourselves, um, also possibly a reason why we feel like our physical well-being is, is lower than that compared to our male counterparts. And I think the final point I want to make is also that, you know, within this pandemic, women have been harder hit than men. Um, women are t almost twice as likely to lose their jobs because of COVID. The amount of unpaid work during a lockdown caring for the young ones and the elderly have gone up dramatically. Uh, and not to mention the final point, which is that 70% of healthcare workers globally are women. Women also take the majority of jobs that expose them to the virus, like teachers, cleaners, and store attendants. Yeah. Great, thank you so much, Dawn. That was a really great overview. So Sam, over to you. As a yoga and mindfulness teacher and healer, what do you see as the greatest challenges for women? Yeah, the Thank you, and Luis. Yeah, and then for the greatest like and challenge like and experience by women, I think like um, it's actually it's like a fantastic. We women like we are capable to do things and, and again on different levels. Um, and also like uh, many of us are carrying different roles. It's like a one done set before. Okay, apart from working in the corporate or like in the office, but at the same time we are a partner and a daughter, a sister, friends and also like uh, maybe mothers. Yeah, so we have like uh, many hats on us, okay. After work, and then we still have to do many things, okay. So like uh, very often, like uh, we actually like uh, fill our plate with many different things, okay. But often like we feel like, oh, we have to commit to all the responsibilities or our roles. So like uh, making us at the end of the day, is like uh, so overfilled. Yeah, and sometimes again, like, we feel like, okay, we have to commit on this and then we can, we have to do more and more and like get better and better to be perfect. So at the end of the day, we become like, a, we don't have time for ourselves to, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Sam, thank, thank you. you. So over to you. So you've worked in high-end spas across the world from the Americas to Europe, the Middle East and Asia. You've said that you see mainly two groups that come through the spa. You've got the high-end, busy, corporate or entrepreneur who has very little time on their hands. And then the other group, which is that individual that's coming in to be pampered or for a treat. So for the purpose of this panel today, we'll be focusing on the, the corporate or the entrepreneur who's extremely busy and has very little time on their hands. So can you tell us three observations that you have made of women with little time on their hands and the challenges they find in taking time out for themselves? I can, and it really sort of follows on Dawn talking from you know a medical standpoint the first thing would be uh, women obviously feel that guilt they want everything to be perfect um, and they're trying to juggle as you've just said as well you know everything all at once and quite often you know they're prioritizing everything else before themselves they'll probably in inevitably put their career first um, then will come their family maybe their friends and last of all will be themselves where in reality they should actually be placing themselves first 
um, you know, and having that ability to do everything else that comes along with it. The second thing is um, switching off. Now, you know, we all know that we need to switch off, but there's so many women that, uh, again, they, they can't, um, you know, and it's, um, I mean, Dawn, you mentioned about here in Hong Kong, just yeah. as an example, you know, work here um, is quite stressful mm -hmm. at the higher levels, and I think people are feeling a, a lot, of, uh, under a lot of pressure, you know, to perform and to, to also prove themselves every single day. And so would almost feel, oh my God, you know, I can't switch off because I might lose my job or, you know, something dreadful will happen or, you know, that they think that juggling everything all the time is keeping everything going. Now, Dawn, you, you mentioned it very, so you touched on sort of an, our male counterparts that I would certainly say from a spa perspective, you know, men have much more of an ability to switch off and zone out. Women don't, um, but men will come to the spa, they're happy, you know, they'll chill, they'll take time out, but... Women quite often, I see it um, in the spa particularly, we've got some people, can you believe, you know, they will come in to have, you know, treatments, particularly a massage, and they will actually still be on their cell phone under the table. <laughs> or we've got people coming into the salon, and we've had the Mandarin salon at the hotel, um, and, you know, they feel they're so short on time. You know, so I have someone doing their hair, someone doing their nails, someone doing their feet all at the same time, and they'll still be on their laptop, still be on their cell phone, doing all their emails. Um, literally can't switch off and the last thing is that illusion of time you know and I think we all have more time than we think hmm. um, and yet everybody particularly women are trying to fill every single part of the day in order to almost justify their existence um, you know when in reality you know they need to sort of calm down and rein it back Fantastic, Sue. I think one of the great things about the panel today is we've really found expertise looking at the research and the insights from that angle, but also looking at a perspective that perhaps isn't communicated often and the insights that you're seeing when you've got your students and you're teaching and you're also coaching uh, you know, yoga students and yoga teachers and then also, Sue, for you to be bringing your expertise forward from what you see in a place where people go to relax but yet at the same time still can't mm. is really interesting. So let's go on to you, Sam. Mm -hmm. I'd like you to tell us what you find that women struggle with or if you find that women struggle with feelings of guilt. And what do you say to those women in terms of those women that are really struggling with the feelings of guilt and how they can actually take time away from themselves without feeling that emotion of guilt? Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. And especially like, just now what Sue said, like, and it really echo with me too. It's not only happen in spa, even in yoga studios yeah and we come to yoga we want to like have a time off just for ourselves right but the um, the issue is like and we all are so busy yeah and then like especially women yeah so we often like and when we go in teaching yeah, actually it just happened this morning I, I was teaching yeah and before the class they were working and in the changing room like with a laptop and sometimes even like and you can see them like they're still checking on the phone and they're in the class or like yeah, we cannot bring phone in the class, but you can see them like now with the technology, we have the um, smartwatch, right? Mm -hmm. You can see actually like from time to time, it seems as like in, under the spa table yeah, or in the salon, and they are watching like in the spa and the and smartwatch mm. to check the message to stay. Yeah, so like uh, they, I think like uh, it's not only them, I think like uh, for all of us, like uh, we struggle to about like the stress. Yeah, it's very like a uh, common. Um, in classes or like and I work with like and different women in classes or in trainings yeah what I notice is like and very often they they come to class or they come to the training they feel like oh I should stay home or I should like and stay in the office for more time like and to finish my work or like and to take care of my families my children okay um, particularly like and for one like in really obvious example is like I teach prenatal and postnatal classes too yeah, um, for mothers after giving birth, very often, okay, I won't see them, okay, maybe like half a year or a year after. Yeah, it's because, like, again, they just want to spend all the energy, the time to be with the young baby, which is, again, that it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but very often, like, and sometimes after they resume working, they just, okay. And they have to go to work, and they and after work they have to like and spit and, to, and going back home to take care of the baby. Yeah, so like at end up they forget to like give themselves the time 
and for themselves to come back to practice. Mm. Yeah, and, and that example, again, I see very often is, and I teach training too, yeah, especially the prenatal and postnatal yoga training. Um, surprise you, they're very often, again, those and women coming to the training, actually they don't think, like, again, they want to teach, or many of them, like, they're not teachers too. Yeah, they see this, oh, that's a nine days training. They want to come to give themselves like in the private time. It's like a bit like an extent spa time too. Yeah. Mm. But during the training, they still struggle. Yeah, they might have to um, run all the errands before coming to the training. Okay. During the training, you see them, they have to call maybe the helpers and to arrange everything for the family, for the kids. Yeah. But like a, one thing like it made me feel really like um, glad and happy is like an after the training, you can see the happy smile on the face. Like, and they feel more content and full and fulfilled. Mm. Yeah, it's really good. Thank you, Sam. Thank, Thank you. you. So, Sue, we're going to go over to you and we're going to talk about burnout. Sue and I had a conversation last week about burnout and your experience with that and what you see in the spa is incredibly interesting. So can you share that with us? Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, I've seen it um, all over the world. Um, and I think probably um, Dawn will be able to expand on this a bit more because quite often, you know, it's people, especially working at the top level in corporate business and high flyers, um, so easy to, to reach burnout so quickly when they're trying to juggle so many things. But the main thing is too many people actually don't recognize it. Um, and it will take, you know, quite a bit of time for them to actually acknowledge and realize that they need help. You know, they'll think that they're holding everything together and they're keeping everything going when, in fact, you know, they're, they're literally falling apart mm. and they're not really recognizing the damage that they're doing to their body. Um, you know, internally, you know, we can internalize all of that stress and give that feet, that impression outside that um, everything is fine mm -hmm. and everything is under control. But, you know, the damage inside, um, it can be long term and can be quite serious, um, you know, and Quite often women, you know, when they're dealing with high stressful jobs, etc., they might be reaching for things to actually, um, you know, try, try and sort of modify that. Maybe they're drinking alcohol, thinking that that's going to wind them down at the end of the day. Maybe they're not sleeping well, so they're reaching for sleeping aids. And when we all know, in actual fact, those are actually doing more harm than good. Mm. Um, so, you know, it's actually not solving the problem. You know, and generally women, you know, need to learn, you know, more importantly than ever now is to, to stop and take a break and to not have to fill, as I said earlier, you know, every single minute of every, of every day and doing something and actually having that ability. And I recognize it here, not many people can do this and actually switching off and just to be alone. Whereas so many people think they need to fill all that time with other people and they actually need to get away from all the chatter and all the noise and stop. And just be at peace, and you'll obviously recognise this, Sam. You know, being a, a yoga, uh, you know, instructor and professional, and something you just mentioned about the cell phones. I meant to mention earlier, Louise. Um, we tried in the spas to actually stop uh, the use of cell phones. You know, in our spas globally, and so, you know, to try and make it a cell free, cell phone free zone, but it hasn't worked. You know, and people get upset. You know, they almost feel like you're taking off their right arm. Mm. You know, to remove their cell phone. And to think that then also doing it in the yoga studio, I mean, it's just incredible. Mm. Something needs to change. Absolutely. I mean, I recently re I, I heard some research about the fact that if you see a phone and it's not even your phone, there are certain things in the brain that go off, like these <laughs> excitement, I don't know, indicators that go off in the mind. So the phone is, yeah, I, I really encourage everyone. I think what's so great today is we're talking about the situation and there may be women listening thinking, oh my gosh, that's me. And we're talking about both the situation but also the solution, so it's great. Dawn, it's time to talk about COVID-19. <laughs> so, Signa have done a lot of research about the impact of COVID-19 on wellbeing and stress. So can you share three ways that COVID-19 has increased stress and anxiety level for employees and organisations and, most importantly, what can be done about it? Right, yes. So. I think COVID has brought about a whole like sort of spectrum of stresses. I think one of which is that the way we work has changed dramatically. Today, we sort of bounce between the home and the office, depending on what the COVID case loads are like. Um, and even that in itself, right? Having to check the news, wondering, are you going to be in the office on, I don't know, March 30th? That is stressful. Um, then there is also the issue of having 
the divide between our personal and professional lives, which can get quite difficult if all of it's done in the same setting at home. Hong Kong has um, notoriously small apartments. So A, it's, di it's difficult for you to have that divide just for yourself. But if your spouse is also working from home and you're both yelling on top of each other on a conference call, that can be unhelpful and can cause a lot of cabin fever, which is also another source of stress. Um, I think we mentioned earlier about the unpaid work of a lot of friends with kids at home who's now having to be both an employee but also a school teacher. And they're like, I can't teach math, right? For the life of me, can't teach math. And now they have to teach math to their kid. Um, so the, the, home, the whole home situation has become a stressor in itself um, because of how work has changed. I think certainly the second bit is also around just job securities, the broader macroeconomic situation, which in many ways is out of our control. Nonetheless, it still causes stress because you know, there is issues of job security. There are questions of you know, some industries are obviously w worse off than others. But even if you keep your job today, uh, will you be remunerated the same amount? Um, what is the bonus going to be like? This is bonus season in Hong Kong today. Um, and all that uncertainty can be very difficult to manage. Um, and I think the last bit that I would say is just this general sense that you have lost control of a lot of things in the last year, uh, more than a year for some places. A lot of us have given up sort of personal liberties and freedoms. Um, in ways we would never previously have imagined in the interests of public health and the greater good. And even now with vaccinations um, that's rolling out, there are still questions on what that future would look like, what that new normal would be, and how our lives are gonna be different. And you know, as humans, we deal really badly with uncertainty. Uncertainty, unpredictability, all of those cause huge amounts of stress. Um, even if we don't know if the outcome's necessarily good or bad, but just not knowing, is highly stressful for, mm. for many people. Yeah. Great, thank you, yeah. thank you, Dawn. So before we head over to Sue, I want to also just reiterate to the audience that we will be sending, we'll be asking or welcoming, we do welcome your questions uh, that will be coming through on the Zoom chat. So please type them into the Zoom chat. There will be time for questions from the public, from the audience. So we encourage you to please engage and send your questions through. Okay, so let's get back to it. Both Pure and The Bee Project provide space, tools and platforms to encourage individuals to take time out for themselves. Sue, why do you think it's so important for women to take time out for themselves? And what do you see as the benefits of this? Well, first of all, um, can I just reiterate again, I mentioned obviously, you know, women obviously probably find it harder to justify taking time out as opposed to men. Um, and this is nothing against men. I just think men have a much better way of dealing with stress, mm -hmm. uh, a much better way of switching off and being able to obviously make time for themselves and their friends and exercise and everything that we should be doing. Um, and women also tend to worry, I think, a lot more than men. Uh, I'm, I'm generalizing here, it's not all men, but um, I think women tend to carry that. Men will still go to sleep at night and probably still have quite a peaceful sleep and re be restful. Um, women might sort of still carry that during the night, they won't sleep, they'll, they'll still be sort of keeping it going and it gets worse. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't know what the, why the answer is, but women just don't have that ability the same as men do. And what we need to look at is the long-term benefit of taking time out and why it's so important because we're already seeing the early onset of things like heart disease, strokes, diabetes, um, you know, and I see, you know, things in the younger generation like high blood pressure um, and anxiety, panic attacks now and pe people worrying so much about their appearance, their weight um, and all of those things, you know, together, you know, don't make for a good mix. Mm. Um, and again, you know, that's why, you know, things do need to change and there needs to be a switch. And obviously what we need to recognize, you know, with self-care and by prioritizing, you know, with ourselves first, and it's not being selfish, um, it's just making sure that we're actually then in a position to be able to give um, for all the unpaid work dawn, you know, and looking after, you know, our husband, our partner, our children, um, you know, our, the people in our workplace, if we are leaders, you know, making sure that we're still able to be that person to everybody. But without prioritizing ourselves first and making ourselves strong and healthy, we're no good to anybody. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. 
Sam. Often women feel the pressure of performing, juggling it all, and managing to deliver on all fronts. What would you say to women about this? Okay, we're talking about pressure. Yeah, mm. the word like, and we always talk about, right? Especially in Hong Kong or stress. Yeah, and I feel like, and actually, the pressure we don't need to see it is like an all bad. Yeah, it seems like with a um, positive pressure, it drives us to like a better place and healthier too. But what I see, like and even myself, like in my friends or like in, in classes, in trainings, sometimes like and we are being controlled by the pressure. Yeah, and then we always ask like and what they don't and so that before we always feel like um, we have to do more um, like and with all the um, and different roles okay? and also like we have to feel every second every minute with something mm -hmm. yeah we human are so used to it yeah actually like we are more like an uncomfortable at a time we do nothing yes and also like and we are very uncomfortable at a time we feel like i cannot fall okay i cannot fail Okay, it's like an, I can see it like when I teach, like an, this is a very vivid example since I teach yoga. Whenever we are practicing some balance poses, you can see people's faces are struggling. Yeah, because like an, they want to be perfect. I think this is fine, mm. but and we have to learn how to deal with the pressure or uh, like an, how to be friend with the pressure. Yeah, often like an, in practice we say, find the comfort in discomfort or like an, and learn to love it. Mm. learn to love something you don't know and learn to be with the pressure okay and also one thing i feel is very important is we have to know okay, especially as a woman like as a woman like we have so many different roles and it is okay to be not okay this is very important mm. we always feel like we have to be perfect mm -hmm. it is okay to be not perfect yeah we are just human being we can make mistake and we learn from the mistake yeah. And like, and when I teach and training in the prenatal and postnatal yoga training, in the first day and first beginning, I and stress to them that this is the space for us to make mistake. It seems like uh, when we make mistake, actually, like um, we can learn from it, and also like and um, we can learn how to deal with the moment we are making mistake. We cannot meet all the commitment or the pressure. Yeah, so that like, when we teach our system, okay, whenever like in, in our daily life, we are really like in dealing with the stress, we know how to be friend with it, to mm -hmm. go with it. Yeah, so like, very often like, you can see like from the faces and in the, in the trainees, yeah, they just love at it because like, and they know we are doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. They acknowledge it, this is really true. Yeah, mm -hmm. so is it okay to be not to be okay? It is okay to be imperfect, mm -hmm. yeah. That deserves to go on the front of a t-shirt, Sam. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You, Thank you. Okay, Dawn, let's move over to you and start to talk about the long-term effects of stress and not taking time out for you. Yeah, thanks. I, I think that's a good segue from what Sam was saying earlier, um, which is that not all stress is equal. Um, acute stress, which all of us face daily, um, is important. It's, it's crucial to survival. Um, and it's part of our evolutionary trait, right? Back then, if you were a hunter and you didn't run from the lion, you get killed, and so you wouldn't survive to sort of pass on your genes. And that ability, to, that fight or flight response is important to how we deal with day-to-day -day issues. Some of us will say that having that deadline at work, um, moving to a new country, all of that um, allow us to thrive. Some of us perform better. Um, but, but when we say you know, that long-term stress is unhealthy, what we're really talking about is this prolonged exposure to multiple stressful situations or events because um, there is a cumulative impact to this. And Sue mentioned earlier about high flyers. Now the thing with high flyers is because they are high functioning, a lot of them can take a lot for very long um, and still maintain um, and still function daily um, like you and I. But then something happens and it just tips them over the scale. Um, and we've seen this so many times, right? Employers or managers saying he was fine, like delivering on time. And then suddenly one day it's like as if something snap and they just mm -hmm. go down this path of either binging on alcohol. They just stop showing up for work. Um, and next thing you know, they're just in a mess. Um, they've just gone off the bend. So it's important that we realize, um, especially for high flyers, that they have a huge tolerance level, but that if we don't intervene um, early, that they go down a really long and slippery path 
um, and, and that's really hard to climb out of. Um, Long-term stress in general puts your body in this really chronic inflammatory state that will give rise to a multitude of issues that um, interestingly comes out as a physical symptom, so like neck ache, back pains, why they mm. go to the spa, um, headaches, migraines, obesity that Sue mentioned, a lot of acid reflux, heartburn. So the, the chances are you'll probably present your GP first rather than to a therapist because you're experiencing these physical symptoms which make you highly uncomfortable. And if the physician's not asking you questions to get to the root cause of it, mm. then you might just be getting some painkillers and then off you go. And then the root cause is never really sorted out. Um, for women especially, I think uh, chronic stress can really mess with your ovulatory cycles. So irregular periods is very common, um, mm. and then obviously that will then impact fertility if you're planning for children. So certainly I think it's one of those things that, you know, if there is just greater awareness of the conditions, then you just um, need to be aware that perhaps if that lower back pain is not going away, despite multiple trips to the chiro or the physio, might be something deeper. Um, and, and a chat with, with a professional like healthcare um, practitioner might be helpful. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Dawn. Thank you. Sam, in your 13 years with Pure Group, what have you seen as the results of yoga and mindfulness for women across Asia? And secondly, my second part of the question is, do you recommend that women who perhaps don't have a self-care practice develop one in a ritual style? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, during the like in the 13 years and teaching working at Pure, okay, and in Singapore and before in Taiwan and in China, okay, one good thing like in we like especially as like the teacher, yeah, we are really like um, glad to see it. It's like um, actually people are really like um, taking yoga practice, mindfulness practice, like um, as the way for them to deal with the stress or busy life or even like and like what dawn said before with all the symptoms like because of the stress showing up they come to yoga yeah and they often they come to us like saying that oh, i have a bad pain or shoulders and and discomfort or injuries yeah but like when you talk to them after a while and very often like again it always come and from the stress they have it's like a not really like a physical like mm -hmm. injuries or anything mm -hmm. yeah and also you can see in the beginning, I think like um, 10 something years ago, especially like in Hong Kong and in the yoga scenes, okay, and we always and went for a very strong practice, yeah, for a powerful practice. But in time, um, especially women, yeah, and they like, and they now like, and they are looking for more healing practice apart from a bit active practice. Like for example, yin yoga and restorative practice. Um, yoga therapy and also like a meditation mm -hmm. yeah we run a meditation program it's really like it's successful and it's very popular okay? mm -hmm. especially at lunchtime yeah so you can see during lunchtime like uh, often people coming to practice uh, people and working in the office yeah in, from the corporate world they really squeeze an hour to come for they might be just like a sitting there an hour for meditation too mm -hmm. yeah but like and they know like and they need that they come for it. They're asking for it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that is like in the, <coughs> excuse me, the like in the wonderful positive like uh, impact we see a pure in other like a uh, yoga practice too. Mm. Yeah. And we talk about the um, the ritual, right? Yes. Yes. The ritual. Like, um, yeah. So like it's. I think it is good to set um like a regular practice or like a schedule for us to take the time out, like and maybe doing some meditation practice or go to spa or any, anything like that, which is helpful for you. But at the same time, I felt like, and this is like, and sometimes and we're busy already. Like I can see from like some people, they're busy already, but like they know, oh, I have to squeeze some time like um, to do the yoga practice, for example, mm -hmm. okay. But because of like, um, the plate is really full already. And sometimes like they, the yoga practice or the meditation practice, the schedule in make them even more stressful. Yeah, so like, um, what I would suggest is, um, we still like it set the time, like making it as a ritual, but be gentle to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so mm -hmm. like, um, be flexible as well. Okay, if sometimes like uh, we really cannot make it, we don't have to like blame ourselves. Yeah, we can just like, okay, today I cannot make an hour practice, maybe just 20 minutes or 
15 minutes, even sometimes five minutes, staying in child's pose or doing some gentle cat and cow, mm. which is helpful already. Mm. Yeah, so always be gentle to yourself, be friendly to yourself. Yes. Yeah, I think like uh, you have to be like uh, be your own and friend. Mm. So like uh, slowly, this is just like when we brush teeth every morning. Like uh, we don't have to like uh, write down on our schedule. Okay, brushing teeth in the morning or at night time, right? So we slowly making it as our habit or like a part of our life. Mm. It will just come more naturally. Yeah, and then you feel like oh, I enjoy it. You have to enjoy that space, that process, that moment, Fantastic. just for yourself. Thank you, Sam. There's an option for every woman out there. Mm. <laughs> Thank you, Louise. Fantastic. So our sponsors today constantly emphasize the importance of taking time out for you, even if it's just 20 minutes. So let's get practical. Sue, if there are women out there that may not have time to book a treatment at the Mandarin Oriental, but they have 20 minutes for themselves, would you recommend that they take it? And what would you recommend they do with it? It's so simple, you know, if they've only got a short time, and ideally we would be doing, you know, 30 to 60 minutes of exercise each day. And we, we all know that that potentially is not so practical in the working week, possibly. Um, so if they've only got 20 minutes, whether that be in the morning or the evening, um, I would suggest, you know, go onto YouTube. You can get some great yoga, um, you know, videos that you can follow. And they, you can get the short ones, you know, they're 15, 20 minutes and they give you just that really, just that good little time out that you need and mm. they also give you a bit of exercise. Alternatively, you mentioned some um, meditation. I think meditation, especially if people are seriously stressed out, just if they, it, it takes time to learn how to meditate, but that's also an option. Um, or simply, we all talk about the, these days and everyone should be becoming more aware of breathing. Um, and proper breathing techniques, you know, are so essential to our internal organs um, and also, you know, our, our external sort of stress levels, etc. So just doing that for 20 minutes would just be fabulous or some stretching, maybe coordinate some breathing and some stretching together. Very, very simple. Um, and, um, you know, I was going to say here, especially in Hong Kong and China, I mean, they really do have it right over here. And you see every, every time you're going out at the weekends or during the day, you know, the older generation, you know, they're doing all their, their tapping, um, their Tai Chi, which mm. is so calming. It's even just calming to watch. But they really do understand how to take care of themselves. Mm. Fantastic. Thank you, Sue. It's so interesting, actually, because when I was speaking to both Sue and Sam, and I said, would you recommend that women should have a meditation practice, even if they only have 20 minutes for themselves? You both said, focus more on breathing exercises, mm -hmm. because sometimes that meditation, diving into the world of meditation, be quite stressful. And if you breathe, you automatically calm down the body. Yeah. So that was really interesting coming from you both. Dawn. Now it's time to talk a little bit more about um, three practical tips that you can provide women in the workplace to stop, relax and restore. Yeah, so I think a lot of it's been mentioned earlier. Um, what I would say is just the first one would be just to take breaks throughout the day. Mm. Um, it's important your mind has some time to completely disconnect from work, whether it's that 15 minutes you're doing a YouTube video or going a walk around the block if you're working from home. Um, I once sat on a panel with a psychiatrist who says, you know, it's interesting that only smokers uh, take smoke breaks, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. The people who don't smoke, we don't take any <laughs> breaks, which is ridiculous. <laughs> so that's, that's the take home <laughs> to always um, take a break um, every couple of hours at least. I think the second piece which Sam mentioned was to have a routine. Um, I personally would block out uh, an hour, 90 minutes in the calendar which is non-negotiable <laughs> unless it's life or death, uh, because it's important to have time carved out just to do something that you have to do, whether that's walking the dog or yoga or the gym, mm -hmm. because I find that when you have something that is regular and built into your day to day, when the rest of your life gets very difficult, and it often does, it becomes something you can lean into, mm -hmm. um, especially with uh, yoga. Um, I went through teacher training uh, with Pure and what I would say is one of the first few questions they ask is why are you here? Why are you doing this? And easily 70% of the women will say that they're, they want time out for themselves but also because there are other things in their lives whether it's the marriage, the family, the kids it's just not going well 
and mm. it's almost like a place where you seek refuge. So I, I find having something that is consistent, that's reliable, that you can lean on is important. And I think the last bit is, um, again mentioned before, I think uh, to be kind to yourself. Um, you know, someone told me before that the relationship we have with ourselves is the most important one of all because it shapes our relationships with everyone else in the rest of the world. And if you don't start by looking after yourself, then you can't look after anyone else, right? It's like when you're on a plane and they, not that we remember what it's like to be on a plane now, but they, you know, <laughs> if the oxygen mask comes down, you put it on yourself before you put it on the person next to you. So same philosophy, really. Mm, yep. Thank you, John. And Dawn, I'd like you. To, I'd like to stay with you for a minute. Okay. I know you have a lot of experience with working with organisations around wellness programs, and I'd really like you to just talk to us a little bit more about what you've seen around that, and also the things that you recommend that organisations do in order to invest into the mental health of their employees before they have to develop or invest into the cures of the stress and the burnout and the breakdown. Yeah. So, I think if there's a silver lining to to the pandemic, it's been that there is now greater awareness of mental health disorders, but also a greater willingness to have an open conversation, even within the workplace, about the struggles we have. Um, what I've also seen as a positive change in many organizations is that leadership is now coming out with a lot more empathy. They are mm -hmm. recognizing that women and men have different roles, whether it's partners or children, siblings, spouse, and they are making allowances for that, um, putting in place things like additional child caring leave during this COVID period, um, equal parental leave to encourage men to also take on some of the domestic responsibilities, um, and certainly a, a much greater willingness to now invest in mental health benefits. I think ensuring that employees have access to employee assistance programs, counseling and therapies is important because if you drive all these awareness, but there is no concrete channels or solutions for them to access for help, then you know, it's, it's a bit like, so what? You can't mm -hmm. really move the needle. Um, and what we've seen is companies are now exploring what they can put in place to help employees deal with mental health issues, especially around stress and anxieties, uh, which, have become, which have always been an issue, but certainly a lot more during this pandemic. One of the programs we've always encouraged organizations to put in place is um, something called First Aid for Mental Health. Mm -hmm. It's an accredited course run by a lot of the therapy centers here. And you basically enroll HR senior managers uh, into a program that's two to three day long. And they get taught how to pick up signs and symptoms of people who may be struggling because managers are the first line. They're, they deal with their employees every day, and if they are unaware of someone working for them who may be on the verge of breaking down, mm. then nothing really works. So putting these sort of frontliners in the corporate world into a program where they get a better understanding of mental health disorders and how it presents mm. can help create like a safer space in the workplace for discussions of those issues, but certainly also picking up individuals who may be at risk and encouraging them to, to seek help. Fantastic. Yeah. Very interesting, Dawn. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, so now it's time to move over to questions and answers from our Zoom audience. We know you're out there and we want to hear from you. So, Christiani, what have you got for us? Right, so there are a few, but I'll start with one that was posted earlier by um, one of the um, audience, Donna. She's asking about mental health, which you guys talked about. The question is, Mental health has continued to be a big issue, especially in Hong Kong, with people locked up, quarantine, losing jobs, etc. And it's not properly addressed in Hong Kong. It's still a bit of taboo. But also, there is definitely a shortage of mental health professionals to help people in need. So the question is, how do you reckon we can go about to prevent and improve this? To imp so how can we go about addressing or preventing the issue of mental health in Hong Kong when it's still something that's not so openly <laughs> That's a good question. Um, what I would say is yes, I, I agree that um, if you look at the healthcare provision landscape in Hong Kong, there aren't even enough mental health practitioners uh, for, for the general public. Uh, the number is one of the lowest across Asia, but certainly globally. Some of the good work uh, that some organizations in Hong Kong, like Minds Hong Kong, is doing is allowing um, not just psychologists and psychiatrists, but also 
counselors, therapists, and social workers who can deal with the more like minor conditions that don't require medications to train these individuals who can then take on some of that extra workload um, from the psychologists and the psychiatrists in a bit to relieve this, this manpower shortage. But access to care is an issue um, because private sector waiting times are at least three to six months if you want to get a subsidized consult. Private care is really expensive and most mental health conditions require at least two to three months at least of sessions, which is out of reach for a lot of individuals. Mm. So certainly I think there is a gap here that I believe corporates can fill by essentially investing in more services and benefits uh, for employees uh, that they can tap into. So these would come in place of workplace benefits. Um, but I think definitely also as a society, most of the individuals that we can touch today and where we would make a difference are really those who haven't quite gone down the path of actually having depression and panic disorders. But there is a huge number that are just trying to cope with the stresses of daily life. And that if we can just ensure that there, are, that there is enough awareness going on, that we are able to talk openly about a lot of these issues, that in itself would already be sufficient for the large number of us who are just trying to cope. And obviously for those who require more help, then I think there is a need to ensure that they get access to you know, the more, um, more medicalized and clinical uh, services, whether it's in the private or, or public space. But I think step one is always to ensure that we're able to talk openly about it because only then we'll be able to find solutions for it. Mm. Yep. Fantastic. Thank you, Dawn. Yeah, there's a lot of stigma around mental health issues, which you discussed with me last week. So yep. I think that's really important. Thank you. Christiani, what else have we got? I got one that I think it's, uh, you know, applies for all, but uh, it'd be great to see. Uh, the question is, what's the panel's take on men? What's men's role in this picture <laughs> of that we've been discussing? All through the panel. Oh. We would yeah, have been so surprised. What, <laughs> what is the male, male, you know, our male partner in our lives? What are their roles in helping women have more of a voice and combat a lot of those yes. uh, areas that you guys mentioned? Thank you. Yeah, so what is the role of men? <laughs> I'm hoping that everyone can hear Christiani with a lapel mic, so I'll just repeat that question. What is the role of men in this? And we know if we hadn't got that question, it would have been a strange moment. So who wants to take that one on? Can I start? Sure, please. Yeah. Actually, like in, um, when we are in the prenatal and postnatal yoga training, and we also talk about the um, postnatal depression or uh, like in the mental health. Yeah, so and since like that's what the question coming from, and or like the topic today, yeah, we always talk about, okay, and we have to take care of the woman, we have to take care of the mothers, and the mother will experience all this kind of stress issues. But very often, we forget about the men. Yeah, it's, 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 actually, it's the same, okay? And I think it's equal. Both like men and women, we experience and the stress, okay? And the pressure and everything, okay? And I think like, and we have to deal with it more openly, like what Don said before. Mm. And we, if there's an, an issue there, we openly discuss about it, talk about it, rather than hiding it, pushing it down, okay? Mm. Especially in, the Chinese society or our culture mm. get for all this thing. This is like a taboo. We cannot talk about it. We have to put it back. Yeah. But like, um, what is helpful is like, and we openly put it on the table, mm. get, discuss it together, like, and we really gently get with an open mind. And very often, like, and maybe this is not really that and serious. Maybe like, it's just start from a very, very small problem. Okay. It's just like, um, an ice ball, like if you keep rolling it, rolling it and getting bigger and bigger. Mm. Yeah. So like for men, I feel like we just work together as a team. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. we cannot just put all the pressure to either gender. Mm. Yeah. Mm. That's really interesting also, I think, because the panel collectively, there was this idea that came through last week when we were talking about the topic was that it's OK to ask for help. And I think that that's in doing a lot of women's events. I hear this again and again so often. Sometimes the men don't know what the women need because they haven't mm. asked for it. So really use your voice and ask for help. Yeah. 
Sue, were you going to say something? I, I was just going to say, um, obviously, it's, uh, it's a bit different depending on whether you're east or west. And I think here in the east, and you, you just touched on it, Sam, with I think there could be a lot of shame um, surrounding, you know, openly talking about I have got a problem. Mm. Um, and even, you know, with, with men, men like to be obviously the person that's the taking care of everything, uh, the person that's the provider and giving this, this impression that everything's together and it's all fine and we haven't got any problems. And you hear about awful stories coming out of, say, Japan, um, you know, and I think we need to develop, um, you know, something whereby, you know, the men feel that, as you're talking, saying, you know, they need to be able to talk, they need to be able to recognise these issues and, you know, have this equal platform, you know, at home with the family and that there being no shame or embarrassment uh, mm. to talk about problems. But I still think we've got a way to go to get there. Mm. Thank you. Great. Christiani, have you got one more? Um, hold on. Actually, I think one of the yeah one of the questions came as you guys discussed a lot of the tips. But one question is, I think maybe for Sam or and and Don, um, or maybe Sam, why would you recommend? Okay, did you guys talk about me? Why would you recommend breathing <laughs> exercise over meditation? I well, mean, like you talk about to relax. I yeah, I think I'm going to give that one to Sam. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so why would you recommend that breathing exercises over meditation to relax? Actually, like a both um, breathing exercise and meditation are very good, like a tool for us to deal with stress and pressure. But very often, and actually Zhu talked about it before too, and especially for beginner or new to this kind of practice, then we always feel like uh, maybe the first time when you heard about when you heard about meditation, we feel like, oh, this is something really difficult. Mm. Yeah, and then I cannot sit still for one minute at all. Yeah, so like it, it scared people already. Yeah, but um, for breathing exercise, since we are breathing, actually for all of us here, mm. we're breathing all the time. Okay, this is like a very a handful, easy, convenient tool. Okay, we just watch our breath. Okay, um, like an, I, I, I can give you like an, um, one like a first simple, and breathing practice. We don't have to think about oh, breathing exercise. Pranayama, or like in the yoga term, is something um, very technical or I have to go for training to learn for it. No, we are breathing all the time. You just watch your breath, okay? If you're not pregnant, what you can do is watching your four beats breathing. So your in-breath is the first beat, and then pause at the top of the in-breath second beat, and then exhale is your third beat and pause at the end. So just like uh, watching your breath, but our mind actually won't stop thinking. Mm -hmm. This is like, an, I don't can talk about <laughs> a bit more about it, this one, okay. I won't go deep into it, but our mind won't stop thinking. So like uh, when you're watching your breath in here and any thought, crazy thought ideas or your monkey mind will come back, okay, it's okay, we just see it. And then in the out breath, maybe you send it out mm -hmm. and then going back to the breath. Seems like at the breath you are already with it, so handy, so simple, and then you can keep doing it. And then it's easier than meditation. Since meditation is, we always think like a meditation is, we stop our mind to think. We never can t stop our mind to think, yeah. And then that's why like, people feel like um, in the beginning, oh, this is very difficult. Okay, don't think, don't think, don't think. Mm -hmm. The more you ask you not thinking, the more like in you will, all the crazy thought will come out. Mm -hmm. So like, and that's why we, I think like we three also talk about it. It's like um, breathing exercise is like um, maybe the first choice. Yeah, and then when we start doing like um, the de-stress and practice, mm -hmm. yeah. I, so yeah, I, I think what I would say is I think there is a lot of overlap between the two. A lot of meditation yeah. is also a lot, it's about breathing. But that personally, I think on my resolution list for 2019, 2020 has been to meditate for like 10 minutes a day and I've not really been very successful past March of any year <laughs> but breathing is perhaps a lot more accessible I think and for me what has worked um, I also try to do what they say like if you do it after a habit like if you always do it after you brush your teeth you'll do it hasn't worked for me either what has worked for me is if I get really annoyed at work or get into a conflict and for the next five to 10 minutes, your heart's racing, you're pounding, and you have a million thoughts about how you want to you know, really get that person. I go into a room and I use Headspace. Um, 
And when someone talks you through, it is easier. And it genuinely puts you in a better state when you come out of that room uh, and you deal with other people. <laughs> mm. So for me, it's a lot more opportunistic, I guess. Uh, but the Sam's point, I think if you can make it part of your daily routine, that would be ideal. But if you can't, I think breathing's a good place to start. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask Christiana if you've got one more question. And we have two minutes. I'm giving everyone two minutes to deal with this question and answer it. The one question is, um, it's really, which I'm, I'm, I'm hoping the, the, the answer you get is, um, <laughs> what have you guys seen to help women improve their situation? Like, have you seen uh, some, whether it's from the professional clients and uh, or coworkers, that they were experienced burnout or somebody that you know, how do they come around from the burnout? How can a woman turn around from the burnout? And what would be some tips that you would give, even if it's just talk to somebody or, or I don't want to guide this question, but that's yes. the question. <laughs> Thank you, Christiani. So the question there is how do you deal with burnout? And I think actually I'd like to ask every one of the panelists to say something on that in about 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. All right, so very quickly from a spa standpoint, I'll speak. Um, you know, quite often in the spa, and it's a bit like going to your hairdresser as well, people will, will talk and they'll offload, and it's almost like going to their therapist, and they will speak about things very, very personally. And I can say, you know, a lot of our colleagues, well, all of our colleagues are very, very well practiced, and, and obviously we don't obviously cross the border, the line, as it were, into people's personal lives. But there are certain things that we can do to advise and to give them advice as to how they can get help or maybe mm. there's things that we can do for them in the spa to help them. But um, I think it's just um, having that, um, that first position where somebody actually tells you there is a problem. Um, I think you need some help. And it's, um, a lot of people will listen if they trust that person. And once they recognize, I think some people will go into a bit of a panic um, if they really do think they're on the level of burnout. And I think, Dawn, you mentioned sometimes people get to that stage of suddenly they've got a sickness or an illness, you know, you know which is a bit of a wake-up call. Um, it's trying to ca catch those people before they get to that stage um, so that they can actually take measures to then prevent any mm. serious health issues happening. Um, so, yeah, I think once you can catch people early, it's the best way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and... So like from the yoga point of view, like it is similar to what and Sue just now said, like for us go to practice or like an, even like in taking private yoga. Since in private yoga practice, you can talk to the teachers more closely. So like in talking about your, uh, what is like in your issues and stuff, which is helpful, like what Sue you talk about. And then the other thing like an I like in, this is like very helpful for myself too. And then like in my training on to some of my students, since sometimes, like, again, we are all on our own, like, we, experience, we experience the emotions, the issues coming up all of a sudden, right? So like, again, one method I feel is like, again, very useful is like, again, you write it down. Since very often like, again, when we, the stress coming and then the emotion coming out, and what causing problem is how we react to the emotions. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then the emotions taking over us. Yeah. And how to deal with it is like, again, writing it down. Since like in writing actually helping us to release a lot of like in the negative emotions, the issues, like especially when we cannot like reach someone, okay, and it's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. I think personally, if, if an individual is already in burnout, uh, then professional help is necessary, unfortunately, um, because talk therapy is important. Uh, for those of us who are not in burnout, but once they have hit that stage, they would need to either seek advice from a counselor, therapist, uh, or someone who can help them further. For those of us who haven't quite reached burnout, then um, leaning on friends and loved ones is important. I think oftentimes people don't do that for fear of judgment, mm. um, but you know, people surprise you. Um, we've all surprised each other, I think, in this pandemic about how we have dealt with each other in our relationships. So, I, I would say that that is probably the first stop, which is to speak to someone you trust so someone knows, and that in itself can be very healing. Thank you, Dawn. Yeah. Thank you. Well, here we are at the end of the panel discussion, ladies. So that brings us to the end of the panel discussion today, and what a discussion it's been. Some key takeaways for me were the idea of the importance of investigating the root of physical symptoms. Perhaps it's not only a physical issue, Wear many hats, women wear many hats, but remember to also put the self-care hat on sometimes. Consider the importance of putting your first self, yourself first, sorry, so that you can give more to others. 
Ask your phone for a break sometimes. And if you can't do that, then come to a pure yoga class because they'll take it away from you. <laughs> Recognize if you're struggling and do something about it. It's okay to do something or it's okay to do nothing sometimes. And it's also okay to not be okay. I'd like to thank so much our panelists today. Thank you, Dawn. Thank you, Sam. And thank, thank you, you Sue, thank you. for joining us today and sharing your valuable and varied expertise. It's been wonderful to understand your perspective, but also to hear the solution from you all. And thank you to Pure and The Bee Project for your dedication to help, helping people to invest time in taking more time out for themselves. And finally, thank you to everybody for tuning in in the Zoom world and joining in on the conversation. Good afternoon, everyone, and happy International Women's Day.